Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. a series where we've kind of, we've called it kind of now what? And if you are at all on Facebook ever, um, you will notice that all of a sudden you'll get these videos called now this. Anyone else get that? Um, And they'll have these, and they usually pull at your heartstrings or it's something weird like people eating Australian food or whatever it might be, right? There's there's moments. So now what is, is a series where we've been talking about what happens after the climax of Christmas? Like once Jesus is born, now what? And for many of us uh, who have been in different stages of faith, we've had these big mountaintop moments, right? Moments where we just feel like, oh, this is it. This is how it works. Um, You know, I I joke that in college, I just kept getting saved, right? Like, it's just such a good thing. And then it's like, oh, but now what? What does life look like after we come down off the mountain or after life starts to get hard or, or whatever it might be after the reality of kind of how things are? What now, now what? Some of you feel that too when things keep hitting the hard stuff and you go, now what? So we talked the first week at sort of how we're going to use the story of, of Jesus' life and how Jesus' life kind of went through these sort of ups and downs and how the different things after Jesus' life, what comes next is sort of instructing us on how we're supposed to pattern and rhythm our own lives, our own precious lives. So let us pray together. God, this morning, as always, I simply ask this. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, all of us who are gathered here in this space would be acceptable to you because God, you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we lost one of my favorite poets. Um, Mary Oliver. And if you haven't uh, read any of her work, I I actually have a a dear friend of mine gave me just a little piece of this poem I'm about to read to you. um, And I have it over my desk as sort of a challenge. So listen for the last line of this, the summer day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and black bear? Who made the grasshopper? The grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what prayer is. But I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It's that final line that I have over my desk. Tell me what it is you plan to do with your own, we are one wild and precious life. Isn't that a good description for life? Wild and precious. And isn't this an interesting way of of looking at prayer is that we would just pause and notice the things around us and in noticing the things around us, her, her reaction is to feel blessed and to kneel. If I saw a grasshopper, not my reaction. They scare me because they hop very viciously toward me. And so um, I can't be near them or praying mantis. I have no idea why, but they really creep me out. So I can't be near them. I think it's that I don't know where they're going to go. They're really difficult to figure out. But I like the idea of them, which is the same thing with birds. I love the idea of birds. I went through the hipster thing where it was put a bird on it. I had birds on everything. And I had dear friends say like, oh, do you really like birds? And I was like, I think I'm realizing, no, I like the idea of birds. (laughs) Because an actual bird kind of creeps me out. Again, because you don't know how they're going to move because they're wild. And in the same way, our own lives are wild. As Mary Oliver 
reminds us. And so as we talk about this, this life and how we're patterning it and how we look at the life of Jesus, and I want us to look at, uh, we'll just sort of talk through our last couple of weeks. We, we started almost before we got into this series, we were reminded by Kyle how Jesus kind of had this normalcy in that he knew how to disappoint his own parents. I mean, none of you have disappointed your parents, and as parents, you've never been disappointed in your children, but you can imagine. By the way, my parents were ninjas at this. Uh, my parents, they never, um, they're Canadian and British, and so they didn't really raise their voices often, but they would say this sentence, and just, if you feel this like I feel, feel free to groan, they would say, oh no, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. Like even now, I want to just like go home and apologize, Right? My favorite was when my mom said, actually, this is a ninja move, by the way. And she'll say, well, I grew up Catholic, so I learned guilt early. But she said to me, "Um, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. And maybe in myself for parenting you in a way that you thought this was appropriate. (laughs) And I remember saying, and you will be paying for that therapy bill, right? Um... So the fact that Jesus could disappoint his parents is kind of nice, right? It feels a little bit normal, a little bit more approachable. That stained glass guy is hard to approach. But the idea of a teenager who's trying to figure out their identity, that makes sense. Then we talked about, we kind of went backwards a little bit because we wanted to share and celebrate the beginning of the season of Epiphany. And so we talked about the shepherds, right? And how the shepherds show up and and why we celebrate that as part of the Christmas season. We actually are in the season known as Epiphany, which is sort of the celebration of, of Jesus showing up, but that Epiphany is never a realization that isn't a surprise. And Epiphany is always a surprise. And so for the shepherds, the way that Jesus showed up was like, wait, we like brought gold and myrrh and you're like a baby in like a smelly barn. I don't, right? But their reaction is awe. And they go home completely changed. Scripture tells us they go home by another way. And I don't think they just mean the road. I don't think it was just an avoidance of Herod. I think encountering this divine child, they couldn't go back the same way. And last week, we talked a little bit about how Jesus' baptism is just this profound moment where we kind of ask some of the biggest questions. And we ourselves, you know, if we, if we talk about the epiphany as the moment where we get to say, maybe Jesus isn't what I thought Jesus was, right? I, I shared that, you know, in high school, I really was convinced that Jesus was like a boyfriend and I sang all the love songs, right? Um, and then sort of Jesus turns out to not be the, the giant, you know, in the sky that gives me the things if I pray the the right way. Instead, I, you know, I'm constantly amazed by who Jesus is and there's this transformation. Well, then we talk about how Jesus experiences baptism. And it it leads to all these theological questions. And um, if you're a nerd like me, you love to read like everybody's opinions on this, but why did Jesus have to get baptized? If baptism is about removing sin, And we talked about how there was the Jewish connection between the mikvah or the purity. And so John is almost scandalized by Jesus approaching and asking for baptism. Like, no, not you. You don't need it. So Jesus is almost suggesting something different in baptism. Jesus is saying, maybe it's not about cleansing me, but reminding me of my identity as already cleansed. Right? And in that moment... The dove descends and says, this is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. And and I I shared that sometimes we have to remember that maybe it isn't that we are, uh, we get baptized and then we're forgiven, but maybe we're forgiven and then we are baptized. And that maybe it's about our our identity and our real identity is the beloved. And, And anytime we act outside of it, it's that we're acting outside of who we already are. First United Methodist Church is, we've been working on our um, sort of vocabulary around that as a leadership team. And so we, we shared with you a, a while ago how our first part of our statement is that we exist to remind people that you are already loved by God. It's already who you are. It's your identity. 
So then this week, we come to sort of an interesting story, and and I've shared with you before that it's always uh, so much fun for me as a pastor to hear like a ridiculous part of scripture read, and all of you guys are like, yeah, that makes sense, right? We've just heard scripture so much that we're like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Well, let's put it into context for a minute. And I, and I know you know this story, so, or you might know this story, but the idea that um, guys are doing their job, their usual thing, they're fishing, which is actually in this area, um, the area that they're in, uh, Galilee, which is, you know, it's all this little area. In, they're in this area called Capernaum, which is part of Galilee. In this area, fishing was usual. People, that was the biggest way they made their livelihood. And so Jesus just passes by people. It's almost like, you know, Jesus just passing through um, an area and seeing people just do their everyday job and then says, come and follow me. And they go, okay, and put everything down and walk away. And you guys are like, yeah, sure. Who wouldn't just follow a guy with sandals, right? Like, it's a weird, could you imagine whatever your job is, even if it was like Parenting. If you're parenting and someone, some of you are like, I would love for that to happen. Some of you have, you've not seen my job, I would straight up walk away. Um, someone shows up and just says, hey, come and follow me. It's this bold story. It, it demands explanation, but there is none. There's no dialogue. We're, Matthew doesn't give us anything. Almost as if the first miracle of Jesus is bringing the disciples into the journey. So Jesus has gotten his identity. This moment is right after the temptation story, okay? So he's been up, his identity has been challenged, and he has been able to say, this is who I am. And then Matthew doesn't give us a timeline for how long between being up on that mountain, experiencing the idea of this is who I am, to the idea of calling other people in. And I think about the idea of the disciples on the beach and what were they thinking? What were they thinking that they just walked away? There's a really important piece, too, that you were so impressed with Kyle's pronunciation that you might have missed. In the time, your family was your, was your lifeline, your family is what, what helped you get through all things. Who you were was defined by your family, good or bad. You were known by your family. So for these two brothers to walk away from their father, who is named, by the way, we're supposed to notice these things. When someone is named in scripture, there's something profound about what just happened. So for them to walk away from their father, something profound happened. I want us to look at the location of this. Uh, It says that Jesus, some of the uh, translations says that Jesus came away or went away to Galilee. And some folks have read that almost as Jesus was running away from Herod. But actually, Jesus is coming towards an area that is even more dangerous because um, the area where um, Herod, remember he's been in Egypt way back. We know that Herod's play for keeps because what happens in the beginning of the story of Matthew, it's scandalizing, right? Right? Jesus has to run away with his father. Joseph is given a dream right after he's born, and they run away to Egypt, and then all the babies are killed by Herod because he's afraid. And we talked about how when Jesus shows up, some people, it's with great fear they experience him. Some people, it's with joy. But for Herod, it was fear that he would lose power. Now that Herod has passed away and Joseph has returned and Jesus has also returned to the area of Galilee, which is, if you've ever been to Israel, there is this uh, beautiful, beautiful lake area, Galilee. And it's still an amazing fishing area. What's really cool when you're there is you can actually see a boat that was from around Jesus's time. And depending on who you talk to, they say that's the boat that was abandoned. I don't think that's probably true, but it sells lots of tickets. So there is this um, incredible boat where you can see this is how they gained their livelihood. The other thing about this area that might be helpful in this story is to know that this was the area that was promised to Abraham. This was the area that was supposed to be for the people of Israel. This was supposed to be their promised land. And yet, in this time, as they're currently experiencing it, they are under occupation. 
Now, that area of, uh, of the world is no longer filled with strife ever. Um, it's just super peaceful all the time, uh, it, right? It's still an area that is constantly under attack. In fact, even this week, we hear how people just cannot get along and cannot agree with what we do with this area. And it is a muddy, muddy, muddy situation. I was blessed the last time I was there to hear a lecture of a Palestinian along with an Israeli who are friends but share how both of them experience the conflict. So this was an area that even then was under conflict. And we hear this thing as as Jesus is entering, he says, are you ready? Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God has come. And it depends on how people translate that. You know, it says the kingdom of God is coming, is what some people translate. But if you look, probably the closest thing is he is suggesting the ushering of the kingdom of God comes with him. It's not a future event, but an actual, real, and present thing in the moment. Friends, can I tell you a dad joke? Okay, I'm ready. Sorry, girls, it's really bad. Um, I remember why, why I went to this tiny little church when we moved to Mississippi uh, from uh, Canada, and we went to this tiny little church, and we had this pastor who every now and then would tell, like, the worst dad jokes. And now that I think about it, and now that I am a pastor, I think how horrible we were as teenagers because our youth group would sit in the front three pews and act not amused. That was like our deal, is we'd be like, uh, right? So this poor guy is like playing to the worst audience ever. But this joke got all of us. So he said, there once was a small church in the middle of nowhere, which all of us could imagine. And it had this beautiful bell tower that needed to be painted, but they didn't have a lot of money. So the lead trustee or the head guy uh, asked the pastor, what do we do? And the pastor said, I will paint the bell tower. Because as you guys know, pastors are saints, and so of course he would say that I was going to, that's a joke, um, said I was going to go and paint this. And so he goes, and what he realizes is the church doesn't have a lot of money, and so he thinks, I know what I'll do. I will thin the paint. So at least it looks good, and he was a Methodist pastor, so he knew he'd be moved in a couple of years, and by the time it looked bad, they wouldn't know that it was him. And so he um, started to paint the bell tower, and, and what happened is that the, he just gets the paint on, and then this thing happens that we experienced last week where it rains, and so the paint goes down the side of the building. And the pastor thinks, well, surely it can't, paint again, it can't rain again. So he goes up, and he paints again. And once again, the rain comes. And he's thinking, oh man, Sunday's coming. That's what pastors, by the way, think all week long. Sunday's coming, there's nothing I can do. And so he's like just thinking, what do I do? I've got to, so he paints and the rain comes again, a third time. And he hears from the clouds, repaint and thin no more. (laughs) Not bad, huh? Not good, but not bad. And that's often how people translate this verse. Because when we look at it, it is this verse where Jesus is coming and he is saying, repent. And what does repent mean? Well, repent does not mean sometimes what we've used it. It's not a confession. It's not the same as just apologizing. I think sometimes when we've understood the word um, that we're using here in Greek, we think that it's an apology. But repent actually means to turn around. So turn around, change your life, for the kingdom of God is here, is to come, and is coming with me. Now, that's an interesting thing to be yelling, first of all. It's also interesting where he's doing this. See, we're told right before that that Jesus has come to Galilee, has come to this very area because he has discovered that his beloved cousin, John, has been arrested. And we know that John will be executed and silenced. And so Jesus is coming to sort of fulfill the words of John. And people are waiting to hear, like, who's going to, like, the weird locust guy who ate things? He's weird. Um, Who's going to fill his spot of, like, who we watched? Because there wasn't TV, and so they just stared at him. And they're like, who's going to come in? And in comes Jesus yelling, the kingdom of God is here. And that's scandalous because what does that mean? And if you are an oppressed people, what hope does that hold? If you are a people who have been waiting, 
longing, hoping. We know what that feels like sometimes. We may not be under oppression, but there are a lot of things in this world that um, aren't going well, in case you don't watch the news. Um, And there are things where uh, there isn't a lot of people who are willing to compromise. And so they're in this sense of like waiting for things to be made right. And into that comes Jesus and announces the kingdom of God. And, And Jesus does that in a way where you know, the people are, are waiting. And they're, they're waiting, and they, it's this really interesting thing because Jesus has entered into this place. Where this happens matters because it harkens back to Isaiah. The land of Galilee of the Gentiles in Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those who have sat in the region, the shadow of death, light has dawned. And perhaps, as those brothers who are are fishing, maybe they've heard that voice before. Or maybe there is something so shocking about this light that the darkness of Roman rule that they're experiencing, this light causes inspiration. And they don't know how it's going to go, but they do know that Herod does not enjoy an uprising. You know, he's not like, oh, great, yeah, take back your land. That's going to be, yeah, self-govern. Good luck with that. Welcome, refugees. That's not how Herod was. And then his son, who now rules, is even worse. Here it is, a community of faith waiting. And the word used for kingdom here is interestingly enough the same word that Rome would have used for kingdom. So there's, there's weight to this. And then Jesus calls people into this way. But why would they drop everything? Perhaps when they saw a great light, something was so compelling that they cannot go back to the way life was. And they don't know how this is going to turn out. They don't know that one day they will all be martyred. They also don't know that like, for them and who they are, Andrew will end up being the patron saint of three countries. They have no idea that we'll still be saying their names, but there's something compelling and awe-filling about that moment. What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It is an invitation, and they don't know what to do with it, so they drop everything. It's your dramatic change. And, and what did Jesus do? He teaches and heals, but before that, he says, Let me call you into this new way of life. It's interesting how even though his use of of kingdom in a way that was different, it, it reminds us that people who are experiencing absolutely being colonized by other people will use a word that has been theirs but reclaim it in a way. And so Jesus is reclaiming language. He's liberating people. He is showing what power looks like. And he calls them into this way. I want us to notice, though, he does not call them into a certain belief. He does not say, here is the prayer you should pray. Instead says, come and follow me. It's almost as if they don't even know yet what they believe, but they are willing to follow. It's so awe-inspiring. They drop everything. And then Jesus preaches and heals. He cares for the actual physical needs of people. And and even when it gets hard to follow him because there is tons of critique, it's difficult, they continue to follow him. 70 to 90 percent of people in the Roman Empire were at varying degrees of poverty, and those who are not poor were really rich. So you can imagine traveling this land as fishermen who were kind of in the middle. There wasn't a lot, but they were sort of in like higher poverty. (laughs) They were doing better than most, but not great for them to see what was going around. And they think, what does the kingdom of God look like? But it's so compelling that they continue the journey. I think about us. For those of us who, who feel as though we're not really sure what to do with our beliefs sometimes, we're, we're not actually really sure certain things. I mean, we're not, but yet the idea of following this compelling story of Jesus still holds weight. 
because there is awe in it. There is something about my wild and precious life that makes me will, willing to like risk the embarrassment of telling people on a plane what I do for a job. It's the weirdest thing ever, by the way. If you want to see people's reactions, like they should just put a video camera on me and see people like strangers' reactions to what I do. Right? It is, it's something so compelling that you guys are like willing to get up in Southern California and come to a, a church when it's sunny and beautiful, Right? There is something compelling and awe-inspiring that makes you want to be called into following this way. And I want to suggest that, that sometimes we have got it wrong when we tell people that there's like only one purpose for their life, right? Um, there's one purpose, and if you don't know that purpose, I, I, I can't tell you the number of college students I talk to on the phone or people I encounter who are just like waiting for their purpose, Instead of realizing that the call of come and follow me is is bringing people into those spaces and places where you experience awe and wonder and make you want to live this life, those are invitations from the divine to participate in the kingdom of God. And it looks different for everyone. It might be that you would work for Jesus. It might be that you're able to sit with people in pain for Jesus. It might be that maybe you make a meal for people for Jesus. Whatever it is, Jesus is saying, come and follow me. And this year, that's going to be filled with awe. So the venture, the journey, sometimes we have to stop asking questions. And and that's hard because I'm a question asker. But sometimes when there's that awe moment, you just go. I love this story because it's so inspiring to me. And it reminds me of what my favorite ending to a Mary Oliver poem is. And this is, she seemed kind of, they say kind of like she had this weird fascination with death. By the way, if you, if you want to laugh at some folks, and we can take this out of the podcast, but one of the interesting things about Mary Oliver um, is I noticed a lot of my friends who are pretty conservative were posting quotes by her, like, oh, Mary Oliver, one of our greatest poets. I'm like, they do know that she lived with her partner for most of her life, um, I like jabbing it to him, Um, right? But she was this like divine inspiration where it just felt like God was speaking through her and she had these um, sort of fascinations with the tiny things of life from a grasshopper to a blade of grass, but death was always fascinating to her. And so this is uh, the end of a poem and you're you're thinking, why is she ending her sermon with this? But, But listen, when death comes, when it's over, I wanna say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. It is that awe. What do you plan to do with this one wild and precious life? Where is Jesus calling you? Where are you experiencing awe? And may you see that as a divine invitation into what's next. Will you pray with me? God, in all the places and spaces where we're not exactly sure what you're doing or how we feel or what we believe, would you stop us sometimes? And would we just experience awe? And not in a way that's just turned our brains off and we just believe anything anyone says, but, but in a way that wonder and awe just come to play in our lives. And that we experience that as an invitation to bringing your kingdom to participating in that which is already here. Lord, we thank you for the gift of being reminded of your awe-inspiring presence. May we come and follow. Amen.